Okay, hello everyone. This is Melissa Abache um, from Coach University here in Istanbul. Thank you everyone who has joined our webinar today. We have just started the new academic year, so this is the first of our series of webinars that we are going to be doing throughout this semester to help prospective applicants to Coach University um, in terms of how to prepare strong applications. The topic for today is how to write a strong motivation letter or statement of purpose. The idea is that we're going to spend around 45 minutes going through basic um, principles, guidance, and tips, both for undergraduate and graduate applications. I will give you a very brief introduction about Coach University. Then we will go through the content about how to write, how to write a strong motivation letter or statement of purpose. Um, and then we will be able to take questions that I will kindly ask you to write on the chat section. I'm sharing my screen so that you can see my presentation. Um, I think we have now a good number of people who have joined us. Welcome everyone. Um, if you join a bit later, we will be uh, posting the recording of the webinar on our website um, around Monday. And before that, you will also receive uh, an email if you have joined or if you were not able to make it with the same presentation. Um, so I'm going to start now, basically. So to give you a bit of an introduction, um, I hope technology doesn't fail me and this plays well. And I'm going to turn off the sound. This is a brand new aerial tour of our campus so that you can have an idea of what our university looks like. Um, just to give you an overview, Koç University is located in Istanbul, Turkey. It's a comprehensive, research-intensive, private university. In Turkey, we say private universities are also called foundation universities in the sense that they have to be non-for-profit educational organizations. Koç University is um, small in comparison to other universities um, in Turkey. And um, I'm just going to, okay. So I'm gonna close this, I'll play that again. Um, so it's, uh, it's a small university in comparison to other Turkish universities. However, um, that small size in terms of the number of students, it's for a reason. We want to keep our classroom sizes uh, very small so that students have a lot of one-on-one -on -one supervision and uh, a very good quality of teaching in terms of the attention that they will receive from their um, lectures and professors in different classes, lab sessions, problem sessions, and other activities on campus. Um, I will show you um, afterwards the more kind of formal academic structure in terms of our colleges and graduate schools and the programs that we offer. Um, but overall, as I said, we are now positioned as one of the top, if not the top, um, actually the results were released recently by the Turkish Higher Education Council that um, in the scorecard of Turkish universities, Koç is now placed as the number one university for research. So this is something to keep in mind when you're um, looking and doing, again, research about different universities. So this is, as you can see, this, is, this video is now on our, um, on the Koç University YouTube channel. It's also on our international admissions YouTube channel, and you can see a lot of pictures of our campus and how it looks like, our student clubs, faculty members, uh, campus events, campus activities on our website and on our social media channels. Uh, we have them both in Turkish and in English. So I'm gonna stop the video now and move to the next um, slide. So yes, uh, one of the key features of uh, Coach University as a university is that even though we are located in Istanbul, in Turkey, we offer all of our programs in English, with the exception of um, the School of Law, in which, because of the nature of what they are teaching, uh, some courses, well, well, actually, most of the courses have to be taught in Turkish, but everything else, when we look at the other um, six colleges, they're all taught in English. As I was saying earlier, um, we are very, you know, keen on keeping small class sizes and a low student faculty ratio. The other feature of the university is that we offer a lot of double majors, minors, and track program opportunities. So this gives you the, you know, the, the chance to basically explore more than one area of knowledge. If you're not completely sure, uh, this is in the case of 
undergraduate decision. If you're not 100% sure about what field you want to pursue, you're able to first enter into a major and after your first year, apply to do a second ma major. This would extend the total length of your education, but it will give you at the end the satisfaction of having obtained two degrees uh, from the same university. Koç University is also um, a bit different from other Turkish universities and also in the region in that we give um, a lot of importance to offering a liberal arts education. So this means that uh, all of our students, regardless of their uh, major of study, they are exposed to seven different areas of knowledge that range from natural sciences, economic sciences, social and um, sciences and humanities, arts. So the idea is that you will become a well-rounded individual who is able to understand and make sense of the complex uh, problems and challenges um, and dynamics that happen in our wor world thanks to that education that you have received um, through required courses in your first year. Um, in my opinion, one of our strongest assets as a university is our faculty members because they are internationally renowned. They have trained and taught and have conducted research at some of the top universities worldwide. And they bring that experience and that approach to teaching and supervision to our university. So it is, um, you know, it's the same quality of education that you could be getting at some of the best universities in the US, in Europe, uh, in Asia, but here in Turkey. When you look at the, the classmates that you would have if you're applying as an international student, then the undergraduate student body is recruited or it's placed according to a national uh, university entrance exam. And each year we see that our uh, placement results keep improving in the sense that we are being chosen by, um, let's say the top 5% of students in the country. Another great opportunity uh, about studying at Koch University is actually our study abroad semester. So we have agreements for student exchange with over 200 excellent universities so that you can do part of your undergraduate degree, for example, one semester or two semesters at a different country. So this would give you the opportunity not only to experience Turkey and Istanbul, um, besides your, your home of your country of origin, but also a third country that you would have an experience in. This could also be not only um, study abroad semesters, but also internships abroad. Um, the beautiful campus, it's something that, of course, uh, if you have a chance to come to Istanbul and see, we're always happy to welcome visitors, uh, provided that you contact us and let us know that you're coming so that we can arrange a campus tour. But it is a, a beautiful campus uh, with all facilities, including dormitories which are located um, inside the campus. And we have a West Campus, which is around 15 minutes from our main campus. And it's also a very lively campus in the sense that we have a lot of student clubs, uh, a very active uh, social and cultural center that organizes activities every week. So in terms of location, we are about one hour, let's say from uh, Taksim, which is one of the centers of the city. However, there's always something to do on campus. Okay, so very briefly, because I want to now get into our topic. Um, these are the undergraduate colleges that we have at Koch University. We have seven colleges. So as you can see, uh, we have administrative sciences and economics, sciences, social sciences and humanities, engineering, law school, school of medicine and school of nursing. The school of medicine, I know it's something that uh, perhaps many of you who have registered to attend today are interested in. We, we see that there is a lot of interest and demand for our School of Medicine, and we will be organizing another webinar um, later this semester to go into detail about the School of Medicine, the program, uh, the current students, faculty members, admissions, scholarships, and everything else, okay? In terms of the graduate schools, um, we have four graduate schools that span the areas of business, sciences and engineering, social sciences and humanities, and health sciences. The main point about the structure of this is that um, compared to uh, more traditional universities, we emphasize the importance of interdisciplinary thinking and, and practice. So uh, basically, for example, you might be an engineering student but you're, you might have some courses or classes that are located in the, um, in the College of Administrative Sciences building. 
similarly, our research centers and labs have members, faculty members, and for example, PhD students that belong to other disciplines. So the idea is that we get exposed to the knowledge and experience of other areas and our own. And in that way, we can grow and widen our perspective. In terms of the undergraduate degrees offered, you can see the, the majors that are available to undergraduate students at Coach University. And as I mentioned before, there are the opportunities to do double majors, and this doesn't have to be within the same college. So if, for example, you have a very strong interest in both history and physics, you're more than able to apply to do that, okay? There are some requirements in terms of GPA after your first year at the university and some regulations, but in general, this is something that uh, more and more of our undergraduate students are taking advantage of. Similarly, there are minor minors and track programs in each of the, in most of the programs that you can um, take advantage of. When we look at admissions and the topic of today is part of that um, admission um, journey that you will be taking on if you're still in high school or if you have now finished high school and are preparing to apply for university is this. For Coach University specifically for international undergraduate admissions, we have one intake, which is for the fall semester. Um, the applications are usually open in December, so we will be announcing our dates uh, over the next month or so, and the deadline is usually early August. Everything is done online, so we have an online application system that you can see written there, apply.ku.edu.tr. Very importantly, um, we pride ourselves on the fact that we offer a selective and holistic admission process. Selective in the sense that what we would like is to attract and admit and you know, do the best for the best. So we're looking for excellent students, not only academically, but in all senses as, as people, let's say, uh, to join our university and add value to our community. Holistic in the sense that we don't look at just one element of the application. Uh, we look at everything. So the, the admissions committee, which is composed of deans, uh, the dean of students, vice presidents, uh, registers team. So they are all looking at not only that you comply with the minimum requirements, but also that overall you're a, a great package uh, as an applicant. I'm just going to check briefly. Um, somebody was raising their hand, but I will continue if that's okay. Very briefly, again, we will have separate webinars to go into detail about each of these elements. Today's kind of focus is on the motivation letter or statement of purpose. So for undergraduate admissions, we require either an international standard test score or diploma score. The most commonly used um, test score that we receive from applicants is the SAT. Um, in terms of diploma score, it's usually IB or IGCSC diploma scores. And besides those, then you should also provide recommendation letters and um, your diploma if you have already received it and an English proficiency test score such as TOEFL if available. But we will go into more detail about this in another webinar and you can also check all the details on our website and I will show our website at the end of the presentation. Um, one thing that I want to highlight very quickly is that every summer we have an excellent summer research program, which is for high school students and undergraduate students. So we can welcome, um, you know, students from all over the world, not only Turkey, and it's essentially a research internship with one of our faculty members, one of our professors, um, in pretty much all the disciplines that are offered at the university. This is a free program. There's no tuition or any type of fees associated with it. You um, get to stay for free on our campus accommodation. And it takes place between July and August. The start dates vary according to if it's the undergraduate or the high school program, uh, but it's slightly flexible because it's not based on courses. Um, and it's an excellent opportunity to come and experience life as a university student, get to know our professors, get to know our students, live life as a, as a student on campus and enjoy Istanbul in the summer. So you can see there the program website at the bottom on blue. And uh, the, the dates for 2020 for the summer next year are going to be published on that website around um, end of December. So keep an eye on that if you're interested in coming to Coach University 
before you graduate, if you're planning on, I mean, if you're going to be graduating maybe in 2021 or you have already finished and are taking a gap year. Okay, so um, to get started, we try to make this interactive as much as we can. However, for today, we're gonna keep questions to, to until the end of the presentation. But some of the things that, um, to get you started thinking about how to go around the process of writing a motivation letter or statement of purpose, is to check, uh, first of all, of course, what kind of application are you working on? If it's for an undergraduate program or a postgrad program, uh, where is the institution based? So, you know, I, of course, we want to give you some tips and advice on how to apply to Coach University. However, we do know that, um, you know, you have a strategy to apply to different universities and different programs, um, both in Turkey, outside of Turkey, maybe in the US, UK, so according to where you are, there are some, some slight differences in terms of the emphasis that they will put on certain elements and we will go into detail a bit later. Um, what documents are being asked of you? Have they given you a prompt? Some schools, for example, will tell you uh, some specific topics on which to write essays that are a way of, uh, for them to assess your character um, and also to check your writing skills and um, and basically to, to get to know the level of knowledge that you have around a certain topic and your motivation. Um, and for me, uh, of course, it's always important to know, well, how far are you in your writing process? For those of you who have already um, started drafting your motivation letters or statement of purpose, some of you haven't started yet. The main thing is, well, it's a very good step that you're here and that you want to learn a bit more. So now we're gonna talk about expectations. Um, when I talk about Coach University, I would consider that we are uh, you, our admissions process and the expectations that we have of uh, new international students. And this is both for undergraduate and graduate. Here I'm referring to master and PhD programs. It's very American oriented. Um, the reason for that is very simple. A lot of our faculty members are coming from US institutions so that's the type of admissions process that they have experienced in the past that they're comfortable with, how they are used to evaluating candidates. Uh, so that's, that's why you will see that our admissions system or process is very similar to an American university. So when we look at what are the expectations of both Koch and uh, US universities, especially highly selective ones, then you see, uh, that they do receive, as, as is the case for Coach, um, a lot of applications, right? And these are applicants with um, high enough grades, as it says there, not only just people who have met the minimum uh, cutoff grade, but that they have grades well above that, that would make them eligible for admission. So they need to look at other elements to, to make yourself visible and make yourself unique and attractive to the admissions committee, okay? So this is why it's important to think about, well, what are what unique talents, accomplishments you have outside of the classroom? Um, we will see the structure of, of uh, the motivation letter and the statement of purpose, and you will see why. So they don't only, an American selective university and coach, we want to know that, yes, that you're very strong academically, that you have potential to succeed at the university, but that also you have some unique um, talents on things that you can bring to the, our community. So as it says at the bottom, we're looking for well-rounded future students. Um, and here are some examples. So perhaps you are very good at, at a sport or at several sports. And what, what the expectation from an admissions committee is that uh, they will be more impressed by the more prestigious your wins are. So um, if you have won any type of prizes or awards or competitions at national level, international level, that's something to definitely um, tell the university about you. And uh, perhaps you have an unusual cultural or family context. Uh, maybe it's an artistic talent or you have devoted a lot of time to volunteer with organizations locally, regional or internationally. Um, maybe you have set up your own business, your own charity. These are the sort of things that American universities and coach would kind of pay special attention to. Then um, I've, I've named it standard expectations. You could think of this uh, perhaps as uh, 
kind of more general, maybe not just US university. Um, and again, it, because it depends on the application process that you're going through. Some universities will ask you to describe your extracurricular involvement on the application form. Um, but again, if you have a chance to talk about that in your, in your motivation letter or statement of purpose, then again, it's a tool. It's a vehicle to, to tell your academic story and tie it to extracurricular involvement. Um, the, the last bullet point that you see there on the slide, um, it has the word passion, okay? This is something very tricky when it comes to writing uh, a motivation letter or statement of purpose in the sense that uh, admission committees and potential faculty supervisors, when we're talking about you know, uh, an admission to a PhD program especially, they want to see that you're truly committed and passionate about the subject that you're interested in or the field that you're interested in, right? Um, so this is something that you cannot just say, you have to show, right? You cannot, you have to show and tell, let's say. So for example, if you have uh, done a project outside of the curriculum that you took initiative to do on your own, um, if you have read books beyond what your school requires, for example, in a specific subject, or if you have helped other students become excited about the subject because you held seminars, you invited speakers, you organized visits to a specific organization or um, area or company or anything like that, these are the sort of things that people want to read about. Um, and I put there in kind of just, this is me trying to be funny, but like the idea is that not just your grandma or very kind of uh, dramatic situations. Then um, after we move from expectations so that you see what is the difference between uh, what an American university and coach university would be looking for, it's again, we can look at the type of essay. So you will see in some universities, um, uh, they're asking for a personal statement. In others, it's a statement of purpose. Others, um, they would refer to it as a motivation letter. They do have some things in common um, and they have some uh, separate things, okay? I see, I'm just gonna pause for a little bit because I see some people um, raising their hands. Uh, okay, so you, I'm just looking at the questions. I'm going to start reading the questions at the end of the webinar and then we will answer them one by one, okay? So going back to this, to the slide that we have in, in front of us. The personal statement, um, if you want to give a general definition, it's a way of expressing your individual background, um, the reasons that you have for pursuing that specific degree, um, grant, for example, if you're now applying for a fellowship or a scholarship, um, whereas the statement of purpose, it's usually more at the graduate level in which you want to highlight what are your career goals and how you are prepared for the program. They are expecting you to already have a foundation in the field that you're interested in. What they do have in common, and that's the kind of most important part of both, is um, you need to demonstrate very clearly why you belong in this program, why, why you would be a very good fit in terms of the culture of the, of the program or of the organization based on your background, on your experience, on your values. Okay. So now when we look at the personal um, statement, okay, the, the personal statement, you know, it says there, put the person in your personal statement. So it, you can think of it as your biography, okay? But it is not about repeating. Um, if you have, for example, to include a CV in your application, it's not about repeating your CV. It's not about mentioning again the grades that you obtained in each course, right? Um, it's to turn that into a personal narrative that will be persuasive persuasive. That's the key word here. You're trying to convince people to, to take a risk on you and say, yes, we think this student is going to do well in the university. They're going to not only do well, but thrive. Like they're going to fully embrace who we are as a university and join activities and do well academically. Um, that's, that's what they want to be persuaded about, right? So, um, so one of some of the elements that a strong personal statement should have, okay? So 
if you think about it as a, as a cross of uh, your personal, academic, and professional. Professional, in case you've had any type of uh, work experience, this could be part-time, this could be maybe uh, you know, uh, remunerated or not, paid or not. This is a chance as well to detail various life experiences that have developed your character, work ethic, and your perspective on things. For example, let's think of someone that wants to study international relations, um, knowing for the, for the admissions committee to know why you're particularly interested in international relations based on, for example, the fact that you have lived in different countries or that you have experienced specific challenges because of the country that you live in that has been affected by geopolitical uh, events these are the sort of things that you can use to, um, to create a hook. And we will talk about what is a hook a bit later. Um, and again, as it says there, explain how your background particularly suits you for this program or will allow you to contribute a unique perspective to the community. Let's say that um, through your research about the university that you're interested in or the program that you're interested in, you realize that there are uh, no or very few students coming with the same background as you are, from, let's say from the country that you are, um, or with the language skills that you have. So that's something that you can put as an added value of you as a candidate to that program or to that university. So again, I'm repetitive about this, but it's because it's important. The idea of a personal statement is that you do tell a story in a story form, okay? Um, there's a scholarship tip that I included here, um, and, I, and this applies very much to Poch University. So we ask for a motivation letter and everything I've said before applies. So also, if you have overcome or you're still facing any barriers to education in your country or in your city, then you can use the motivation letter to briefly explain those experiences, okay? Now, let's say that you haven't, you're in the situation, um, let's say financially or in terms of your location um, or because of your citizenship that you haven't overcome any significant barriers, then please, we beg you, because this is something that it's, it's very easy for admission committees to, to sniff, to sort of um, get a sense of, to stretch the truth, okay? So the idea is that you are honest and authentic and you can talk about, for example, how certain experiences have actually shaped your perspective or widened your understanding of the barriers that other face, perhaps in your country or um, a wider region that you're part of. Now let's talk about um, details. So details, the idea of them is not to have too many of them, but to actually engage and get the attention of the reader. The reader in, their, in this case, you can think of it's going to be a professor in the program or the dean of the program that you're applying to um, or an admissions committee that reads a lot of um, motivation letters and personal statements every, every day. So again, um, a well-told told story about your life. Um, it can have a funny, it can have a sad sort of um, arch, you know, to it, but it has to be compelling and memorable. The more concise details that you can add, the better it will be. So we will have, I will show you some examples of exactly what I mean in a few slides. The idea is that they want to see how your personal experiences have made you a stronger student from when you started, let's say when you started your high school to when you, where you are now, now that you're you know, about to complete your high school or your university uh, program and how it, it can make you um, a stronger colleague. Um, you can share your motivation and your dreams, but again, be brief. Usually what we see is that um, well-written personal statements and motivation letters, they can be one or two pages. That's more than enough um, space to talk about to talk about your story and convince the readers. More than that, then I'm afraid to tell you very honestly that it's not, is not read. Now, we just talked about the, the personal statement or motivation letter. Now we're gonna talk very briefly about the statement of purpose, okay? 
The statement of purpose is typically uh, more applicable for graduate programs, and it, sometimes it's also called application essays, objectives for graduate study, letter of intent, um, or cover letter. Okay, so now this part, I'm going to be addressing those of you in the audience that are thinking of applying to, again, PhD programs and master programs. So um, similar to what I said before, there's some commonalities. So you might start off with, um, with something autobiographical um, or anecdotal. But here, the emphasis should be actually about how you are prepared to take on a master or PhD level program. So what's your relevant training and your career goals? Okay. A strong statement of purpose should, as I said, focus on your specific research interests within a particular field. Here you can go into as much detail as you want about the topic, the area, the methodology, the region that you're interested in. And again, how you came about being interested in those through your academic and professional experience. When we say academic experiences, yes, you can talk about the courses that you took, but you could also be talking about um, being an assistant, a research assistant in a specific project, joining a group that uh, organized events related to that project. Um, and of course, in this case, any type of publications, posters, conference attendances that you have and how they prepare you again to pursue them at a higher academic level are very, very important. Okay, um, here's some tips. So usually the structure of statement of purpose, they want you to, to go through this sort of order, right? So why you want to pursue this graduate degree? Uh, here we, you know, we advise you can, you can talk about around a paragraph, it could be a long paragraph about what's your specific interest um, for coach universities, this is quite important. You can actually mention specific professors in our faculty, in our departments, that um, their work is very well aligned with your own academic experience or research interests. And of course, the, 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 more in, the more detail that you can explain that connection, the better, okay? Um, after doing research about the program, you can also list specific, let's say, research centers, labs, that you would be uh, a good contributor to based on your knowledge and your interest. As I said, you know, you can uh, detail your experience in the classroom, in volunteer work, um, shadowing opportunities, internships. And again, you can mention your mentors um, if, you had, if you had that opportunity. Um, the fourth bullet point on my slide here, um, this is also important. What do you plan to do with this degree? Okay, I know this might be hard if you haven't even started the program to think about where you will end up after you graduate uh, in terms of which type of industry, where, what type of position you would want to, um, you know, obtain after graduation, but you can be very specific. For example, um, that you have a long-term goal, which is to be a career in and, and here it doesn't matter if you go into that much um, detail, but at least to, to name the industry. Or if you're thinking to pursue an academic career, then you see your, yourself after joining academia or R&D, in the case of, let's say, science and engineering, you can talk about that, okay? And the last bullet point is very important. It's not enough to say that uh, you have done uh, that you're interested in a specific field or that you came to it through extra wire activity, you should back up your claims about activities, achievements with, of course, uh, certificates, pictures, recommendation letters. So this is why what I meant earlier about um, holistic. So on the application form for most universities, including Coach, you will be asked to put some required documents such as test scores, um, transcripts, recommendation letters, but there's also room to add additional documents. So if in your statement of purpose you have mentioned, um, let's say that you presented at a specific conference or that you had a, a paper published, then you can include those as supporting documents in the application. When uh, this is something that I have often asked to our faculty members to help us in terms of recruitment of students for the programs. 
And when we ask what are they looking for, uh, besides, let's say, the, the field-specific knowledge areas, overall, when they're reading a, a statement of purpose, what they want to see is these things that you see on my slide. So they're looking for creativity and focus. Here, what focus means is that um, if they see, for example, a traject an academic trajectory that um, a, a person who started in one major then perhaps changed, then uh, went into a different area, that kind of doesn't tell them very strongly that they're very, very interested in that specific field. Um, confidence and pride in your work. So this is not about bragging uh, without without backing up your claims. It's it's saying that, you know, that you're proud, for example, about your thesis because of the way that you were able to work on it or the mentorship that you had and the relationship that you developed out of that. Um, also curiosity and enthusiasm. And we will talk about how to express that uh, in more detail. Uh, contribution to teamwork and leadership. This is also very important because most graduate students will be part of groups um, or labs or centers, so they want to um, see evidence that you're able to work as part of a team, that you're able to uh, demonstrate leadership skills in terms of organization, uh, crisis management, and uh, you know, re relating to other units within a university. And of course, the purpose of all graduate students, it's really to generate new knowledge. So they want to know that you are able to think independently and critically. Okay, so we have sort of covered the two main types of um, essays, let's say the statement of purpose, more for graduate programs and the motivation letter, which is, um, if we, we can, let's say, box it into the undergraduate admissions. Now, how to get started? It's a bit daunting. Um, especially if you're coming from an education system where you're not regularly asked to put your thoughts into paper, into an essay form, and you're more used to um, multiple choice examinations. So we know that this is a bit daunting. So there are some tips about how to start, right? So uh, we have all heard of uh, brainstorming as a technique. So this could be uh, word webs, charts, free writing, journaling journal, for example, as techniques. And you can look online more about how to do each of this. Um, when you're brainstorming, you can write lists of your strengths, accomplishments, future dreams, um, personal experience that have touched you deeply, that have changed your views on different things, educational moments. Here, when we talk about moments, it's, for example, joining a specific group, winning a, an award, preparing to, for, for a competition, uh, favorite memories, people who have also touched your life, whether that's within your academic life or outside of it, okay? Um, it also helps sometimes to ask trusted, um, maybe family, friends, um, teachers, or professors to tell you what they consider to be some of your strengths um, and accomplishments. Sometimes we can be too negative on ourselves and it, it helps to hear from others what they perceive in us as being um, strengths as, as people and as students. Um, I highlighted the word research because this is very, very, very important, right? You, ne you need to know the program you're applying for. This applies both for undergraduate and for graduate programs. And on my next slide, I'm going to talk about some ways that you can research uh, those details, right? The reason I'm saying this is that um, it does help to mirror some of the language that universities use on their websites, okay? Never repeating word for word. Pla plagiarism is, of course, always a no-no here. But um, again, it helps for the reader who is, an eval you know, uh, who is going to be evaluating you for admission to see that you are um, matching the criteria that they're looking for in candidates. The, the next sort of way of getting started is to condense, right? So there's a phrase here from, I saw in another presentation about admissions that um, it's not a movie, it's an, it's an ICAT. So as I said before, anything over two pages, it's very unlikely to be read after this, you know, in that third page and onwards. So you, may, you can start with a very long draft that could be five, six pages. Again, you're kind of like just um, journaling uh, your your personal statement uh, or statement of purpose, 
but then you can condense, then you can start to rewrite, rewrite uh, edit down, delete, uh, and change. You can use anecdotes, and I will show you some examples of that. Um, and be real, right? You don't need to exaggerate. You don't need to add unnecessary drama. Um, we see sometimes, of course, uh, in the case of Turkey, in particularly, we do get applications from um, countries that have gone through very hard and difficult uh, situations related to economic, um, you know, scarcity in terms of conflict, in terms of uh, ethnic conflict. So we see a lot of very dramatic stories, but the, the, the tip that I want to be giving to you here is that you, if you're going to give that type of anecdote, it needs to connect to how it has actually made you, um, you know, able to face and thrive in a university environment. Okay. And the last tip here, there's a bit more in, in the next slides is always make sure that you have someone read over your work before you submit it. There are now, of course, some um, free online services such as Grammarly. That's one tool that, that I personally use uh, to compose, you know, when I have to write emails and everything else, that, which is very useful, but it always helps to have someone um, read your motivation letter or statement of purpose to check, to, to make sure that what you're trying to say does come across very clearly and succinctly. So I was talking about research, right? So it starts with, you know, checking the university website. You can contact the admissions office. So uh, we are, for example, International Admissions Office or Coach University, and you should never be shy about contact, contacting us uh, via email or in our social media uh, to ask specific questions. If we don't know the answer immediately, we will check, okay, and we will get back to you. And that's usually the case for good, you know, universities. Um, you can look up program rankings, and here there's something to be very mindful about. Rankings are a bit uh, tricky because they they are, in a way, an exercise in comparing apples and oranges. However, you can perhaps be better served by looking at subject-specific rankings in the field or uh, program that you're interested in, because that could give you a better idea of the uh, strengths of that university. As you will see, rankings are composed of uh, measures or indicators related to teaching quality, research quality, um, uh, reputation, industry, um, income, international, uh, what they call the international dimension, which is the number of international students and faculty. So um, what you should look at is what elements are important to you as a student, what are the things that you would value in your education, um, and then, you know, like use the rankings in that way. When it comes to graduate programs, it's, it, of course, it's very important to read about the, the department professors backgrounds, the topics that they're interested in, what they're working on, what they have worked on before, what they're working on at present. And you can do that through their websites, their research groups. And lately, of course, universities spend a lot of efforts in trying to put more content into their social media. Um, we, we particularly always try to give um, a clear picture of, of all the different things that are happening at Coach University from the perspective of faculty members, of our current students, um, of different administrative units to give you a comprehensive idea of what it's like to be a student here. So, and these are all things that you can note down, things that, you know, um, have caught your attention that you think are different from um, what you were expecting or that actually match your, match your expectations of what you want out of university. And you can mention those in your motivation letter, um, especially in the motivation letter. Now, there are some, sorry about the very long font here, but um, we just wanted to emphasize this. So there are some important tips for writing anything, not just uh, admission type essays or type of writing. Um, it's about using your voice. So imagine that you're uh, talking to a friend who's asking you about why you want to apply to that university. So that, that voice and that kind of uh, vocabulary that you use with, let's say, your friends or your family, that's what should come across on paper, uh, not a kind of what you think is expected of, of, uh, of, uh, of you 
and using words that you would never use um, in your normal environment or in your norm normal day-to-day -day life. Um, cast a hook. This is important, like when you look at um, the way that journalists write, they always try to find what is the hook that is going to engage readers to go past the headline and read the article. So think about you and your story and what you want to achieve by going to university uh, to a specific program. What would, what would that hook be? Of course, avoiding cliches is very important. I will show you some examples um, and being authentic. So what are some of the things that we should try to avoid when writing for admissions to a university, right? So these are common examples. So when we say cliches, uh, referring to everything as my passion, the best of the best, the experience opened my eyes. I mean, these are things that admission committees and faculty members see day after day. So again, they become kind of desensitized to the power of these words and they, they they don't take them at face value, let's say that. Uh, other things like, you know, ever since I was a child, I wanted to be a doctor. We see these thousands of times, and, and um, I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, it's very hard to believe. It's more easy, I mean, it's more likely to be engaged by a story of what, at what specific point in your um, childhood or uh, later on in your, in your adolescence, you became interested in in health or in the medical profession, let's say, or things like for as long as I can remember, right? Um, some people also choose to start with like famous quotes from uh, public figures or historical figures or maybe some obscure pop culture references and that doesn't really um, make the cut, right? Uh, try to start personal. So a personal anecdote that it's going to get the, the reader's attention. Don't use a few a thesaurus to find new words. Only use words, you know, this is what I was talking about earlier. So just keep that um, in mind. There is something um, important. So if, for example, you're applying to a uh, coach university or another highly selective university and your um, test scores or your transcripts, you know, for whatever reason, you didn't get the grades that you were expecting, um, that you thought you would do better than that, and there are strong reasons why that didn't happen, you can actually use some of the space in your motivation letter or your statement of purpose to explain why, okay? Um, it's a way of supplementing your academic record. So let's say that you have a GPA that it's a bit low, uh, but if, if you can explain that you have supplemented your knowledge outside of the classroom through, you know, independent study, to internships, through work experience, so whatever the, the, the vehicle was, and then you can talk about that there, okay? Um, the last point, I think the, the next two, I've already gone into that, but the third, the last one, sorry, it's very, very important, which is to never, ever plagiarize. Like most universities now have software that is able to recognize uh, plagiarism in essays and they're, um, I know that there is a growing number of them that are using them in their application and admission system. So again, like that can get you eliminated out of the, the race uh, even before anything else is, is looked at. Um, some other tips. So Again, when you're first starting to write your motivation letter or statement of purpose, uh, don't limit yourself, okay? So write as, as much as you want, and later you can um, edit to word limits. If the university gives you a word limit of, let's say, 2,000 words for a statement of purpose or you know, a very short one of 500 words, okay, get there, but your first draft can be longer so that you are able to then play with different paragraphs and reorganize them cut down um, very long sentences and so on. Um, if you're including a transcript and you're just gonna say that you took X, Y, and Z uh, uh, courses and you got these rates, they can already see that on your transcript. So if you're gonna mention them, um, you're gonna mention them with some extra details about specific activities or challenges or um, you know, initiatives that you took within those um, courses. Another typical thing to avoid is giving definitions or stating facts about the field or the discipline that would be familiar to the reader. So again, 
um, talking about what is medicine or what is mechanical engineering? Why is it important to uh, the future of the world? I mean, these are things that the person reading the essay already knows because they are usually an expert in that field, especially when it comes to graduate applications. Or if, for example, if you're applying for medicine in your undergraduate program, the, in our case at Koch University, it's the deans of the School of Medicine. So they are doctors and they know why medicine is so important. They know what medicine is about. So stating these things, again, if you lose the attention of the reading, of the reader, by using valuable space in your, in your motivation letter to talk about this. So now let's see some examples. So um, this is an example for a master's program, okay? But you can think about how this would apply for a motivation letter to an undergraduate program. So things to not to, okay? Let's look at the first sentence. I'm applying to the Masters of Fine, Art, Fine Arts program in creative writing at the University of X and Y because I believe my writing will blossom and I will be challenged and I can hone my writing skills. All, all very you know, well and good, but again, it doesn't tell us anything about who you are as a candidate. Then um, still not a good example, let's say. Uh, as long as the first part is, you know, I'm honored to apply because you're trying to flatter the university that's, I guess, that's the intention, because as long as I can remember, I've had a love affair with books. Since I was 11, I have known I wanted to be a librarian. People read this and just don't believe it because there is no way of, of knowing if this is true or not. There's no, no facts, let's say, to, to back it up. But it's a bit better. So again, let's remember my initial slide about telling a story, okay? When I was 11, my great aunt Gretchen passed away and left me something that changed my life, a library of about 5,000 books. Some of my best days were spent arranging and reading her books. Since then, I have, been, I have wanted to be a librarian. So that, that at least gets your attention because it's short, but it tells you where your motivation comes from, okay? Here, I mean, let's say that um, you are applying to to change your career, like you're applying to a master program that is different from your initial degree. Um, so you can be very factual, but not very engaging. So here's an example. I used to work in an assembly line in a television factory, and one day I decided that I have to get out of there. So I went to college to save my own life. Again, this is being extra. This is being too dramatic without, without need. Um, here's what we think is the great example. Uh, because again, it engages you as a reader in the way that we're familiar from, from literature and from good journalism. One Thursday, I had soldered the 112th green wire on the same place on the 112th TV remote, and I realized the solder fumes were rotting my brain. I decided college would be my salvation. There's, you know, you might think, well, they're not that different, but somehow the last one, um, it is more compelling for someone who is reading a lot of motivation letters and statements of purpose um, on a regular basis. There are some questions that you can also ask yourself to, as it says here, get the juices flowing, like get, the, get you in the, in, you know, to start answering questions and drafting your, your letter from there. Um, I won't go through all the questions. I also realize that we're kind of running out of time, but I think we will be able to continue for another uh, 15 to 20 minutes if you are able to stay with us. So these are some of the questions, right, that you can put yourself and then start to answer them. Um, this, the third one for me is very uh, important. As Coach University, we're trying to attract international students. So knowing, for example, like, why can't I pursue this in my own country? This is something like you could explain in like half a paragraph about what, you know, what is the reason that you are choosing to not study your undergraduate or graduate degree in your own country, let's say, okay? All right, um, now again, we know that you, of course, are applying to um, different schools, not just one. That would be also um, not very, very advisable. So, of course, you can reuse your statement of purpose or personal statement, but of course, I mean, it has to be said, like, make sure that you're not writing the wrong university name and that you're just copying and pasting and sending the same document to several schools. That's going to get you um, nowhere uh, if you're applying to, like, again, highly selective universities. So 
when you look at the structure, you could always think about starting with, you know, a passionate hook, which could be a story, an anecdote that, uh, you know, has shaped your view on a specific topic or field related to the program you're applying to. Then you talk about your background in the field, like what courses you have taken, professional or volunteering experience. You can talk then in more detail about classes that you've had, um, extracurriculars, publications. I mean, of course, publications is more related to graduate programs. Um, and if needed, as I said, if, for example, your GPA is not very high or you have a gap in terms of your education history, then you can explain that um, near, near the end. Um, then how you, how you tailor it to each school that you will be sending this to is that then you finish by explaining why you have chosen this particularly um, grad school or a university in the case of undergraduate programs. You can name professors, you can name centers, um, and what's, what features of the program specifically attracts you. Some universities do a better job than others in terms of telling potential students about what's very unique about their program in comparison to others or within the country or within the region. Uh, others may have more generic sort of des descriptions of their programs, but again, through the research that you do in the website, on social media, on the professor's web uh, yeah, for websites, you can get to know what is it that the features that, that yeah, are attractive to you, okay? When we look at topics of how um, people like write this essay, some people, for example, focus on having an important relationship. So this could be um, you know, a relationship with a specific professor that shaped your views or uh, with, you know, a person who managed you as a volunteer. So again, the idea of telling that story of a, a relationship with someone is that uh, how it has affected and shaped you, okay? So as it says that, right, not, not just great things about your grandmother because she might be a very nice person, but it doesn't tell us anything about your potential as a future as a future student, okay? Um, then we have service-based activities. That's another topic that you can look at, right? And then, so this is a kind of tricky topic because if you say that you volunteered in charities and you have uh, continuously helped others, okay, that, that's great, but uh, what we want to see is that is that how that made you more self-aware and how that, again, prepares you for university, um, for university life. Um, sports, that could be also uh, an important and relevant topic if you are into sports or you ex especially if you um, excel at sports, right? Then um, if they're a big part of your life, of your life, right, then the idea is that you, you have to tell a story of how that made you a different person, a better person, a better student, more committed, more hardworking, uh, more proactive, that the idea is that you connected to a specific skill or talent or um, character trait. Okay. Now, um, last but not least, um, one thing to always ask yourself before you submit is, if I took out the name out of this essay, um, and just the name, right? Could anyone else but me have written this, right? Like, could this be the exact same story of someone with the same educational, financial, geographical uh, citizenship background that I have? If the answer is yes, then you still need to write more. Like, don't submit yet, basically. Like, have a look and see, well, Am I telling my unique story or is this something that basically is very common to my generation, the people from my school or the people from you know, my country? So always, this is what we mean by authentic and, um, and using your voice so that it doesn't feel like a generic motivation letter or statement of purpose. Here we put some sources and res let's say resources where you can find more um, details from different universities that have very helpfully put um, guidance on, on the topic, okay? And now, uh, here are contact details. So this um, is our global recruitment team. I'm the person here at the bottom of the picture. You can always contact us uh, via email through study at ku.edu.tr 
Our webpage is international.ku.edu.tr. And again, we are always trying to put um, guidance and resources and tips on that website. You can also give us feedback if you find, for example, that some things are not easy to find or not clear enough, please do let us know so that we can also improve our writing. We're also available over the phone and on social media. I highlight our Instagram account because we're more actively using that, again, to present a kind of authentic um, and honest picture of what it's like to be um, an international student and to be part of Coach University. Okay, so we have now reached the end of my part. I'm going to now check your questions that came through the Q&A and through the chat feature of the webinar. So I'm going to first read and then start to answer. So is an application essay the same as a motivation letter? Let me just mark this. Okay, so the it, it just has this different names, but usually from an American university's point of view, you can call it a motivation letter, a personal statement, um, an application essay would be more for graduate programs, and that's what we mean by statement of purpose, okay? Um, another question, how should I state that I need scholarships during my PhD? And what about GRE scores? Are they obligatory or maybe any conditional admission? So I'm gonna answer live. Okay, so depending on the program that you're applying to, in the case of Coach University, the process is very simple. Like if you apply to a PhD program and you are admitted, then you automatically receive a scholarship. So there are no non-scholarship admitted students in the case of Coach University. That is also the case um, for a few universities in the US, and maybe not across all PhD programs, but usually in sciences and engineering, they will always try to offer with the admission a scholarship. However, if you're applying to a program that doesn't automatically offer a scholarship for the PhD, then um, in your statement of purpose, you can explain, right, um, in terms of how to, how to state is that you can request to be considered for a scholarship uh, because your final financial situation is such and such. Let's say you don't have to, I would say more than one paragraph is too much, um, just stating that you would like to be considered for any internal, um, you know, sources of funding or to be guided towards external um, scholarship or grant opportunities that the university uh, is aware of, that also would be another kind of way of introducing the topic. Um, there is another thing, which is some universities, they don't expect you to be asking for a scholarship in the statement of purpose because they tell you on their application uh, information page that you do have to do a separate uh, application for funding. That's the case, for example, for many PhD programs in the UK, let's say. That's a, one case that I know. So you would still have to write a specific kind of petition for the, for the scholarship. We can perhaps do another webinar, maybe not this semester, but next about how to write scholarship petitions, uh, which I think will also be helpful. So thank you for asking that question. Um, now we have another question. So uh, when applying for undergraduate study, should we write a statement of purpose or personal statement? Also a good personal statement help with getting a scholarship? If so, to what extent? Thank you. Okay, so that's, that's a good question. Uh, so for undergraduate study, in the case of Coach University, we call it a, a motivation letter and you can also understand it as personal statement, okay? Um, will a good personal statement help with getting a scholarship? Yes. Uh, Again, I'm talking now in the case of Coach University, definitely so, because our scholarships are based on academic merit or financial need. And the academic merit scholarships are awarded by the deans who are also the ones who um, evaluate the candidates for admission. So the more you're able to impress them in terms of your, um, your past, meaning your academic background, your present, what you're focusing on, and your future, meaning like what they can see as potential for you, they will usually try to offer a merit scholarship to make sure that you join our university and not another one. We never want to lose, you know, the best students. We want to make sure that they come to us and not anywhere else, okay? Um, let's see. 
So another question, for the SAT exam for undergraduate submissions, is the essay part necessary? Uh, in the case of Koch University, no. Uh, we just look at the SAT 1 um, general test and it can be without the essay. That's why we asked for a separate motivation letter. Okay. Another question, could three-year gap uh, affect my application in undergraduate? As I said, if you have specific challenges, barriers, problems, issues, whatever you want to call them, uh, then you need to explain them in your, in your motivation letter, in your personal statement, because they won't be able to guess what happened to you in those three years from your transcripts or if you're including a CV from your CV. So if that three-year gap was because of health reasons, because you started to work, because you traveled the world, because you had to care for a family member, whatever the reason is, you can explain me briefly in around a paragraph so that they understand that despite having that gap, you continue to have a goal to, to join a university and to complete an undergraduate degree. Okay. Um, what is the amount of motivation letter? I'm, I guess here the question is referring to uh, word limit or number of pages. In the case of Coach University for undergraduate uh, applications, we don't have a word limit or a number of pages, but best practice tells us that, uh, again, uh, one page, one page and a half, maximum two pages is more than enough to talk about everything you need to, to talk about. For PhD and master programs, again, there is no set word limit, but um, there are some specific PhD programs in our university, such as um, psychology, for example, in which they do give a guideline uh, and I think law as well, they give a gu guideline in terms of the maximum number of uh, words. Okay. Um, some universe, another question, some universities ask for a cover letter besides statement of purpose. What are the difference between these two? Okay. So the statement of purpose then in those cases is expected to be a much more detailed explanation of your um, of your research interest, how they align with uh, the department or the the, old, yeah, the overall program research uh, focus areas. So that's the SOP in that case is entirely it's it's it becomes very close to a research proposal. And usually, good PhD programs they don't expect you to marry that that research proposal in the sense that they're not expecting you that if you said this is gonna be your, your research question, then that's what you're gonna be end up doing for your thesis. You may be able to change your mind um, and decide on something else once you have started, but then they're expecting in that statement of purpose to go into a bit more detail on what would be the research questions that you are interested in, an outline of the methodology that you could be employing, um, an outline of a uh, time scale that it would take you to do that and how, you know, the feasibility, like the, how realistically is it that you can achieve uh, that in the, the, within the program period, let's say, um, as a way of seeing like, could we actually accommodate this student with the ambitions that he or she has for the, for the program? And then the cover letter in that case, then it's a more, it's more of presenting yourself in terms of, again, of your academic background, your um, career goals after finishing the the PhD program and um, and your yeah why why you're choosing that specific program at that university. So I hope that answers the question. Now another question: What if three professors work on relatively different fields, all of which happen to be our interest? That's a very good question. Um, when I talk about what professors at graduate level are looking for, I mentioned the word focus. So if you do mention three professors that are working on different fields, here with here what I think you're saying is, for example, let's say within um, within industrial engineering, you would you are attracted, let's say, to work with professors. Some are working on operations management, others on supply chain management, others on let's say another topic, okay? Uh, saying that doesn't really demonstrate focus. So that's, so I, would, I would say try to avoid. So actually try to really go into, you know, self-examine what is it that you are mostly interested in that you feel that you could spend four, five, even six years working on day and night as a PhD student. 
And based on that, then say, well, uh, if I'm going to mention names in the statement of purpose, then it's going to be this name, specifically this professor, uh, or the professors who are on that topic, rather than just um, saying, kind of like, I'm interested in this, but it could also be this, but it could also be that, uh, if they're very different, okay? Um, another question uh, related to the SAT. Uh, this is more about our admissions, but I'll answer this. Um, is SAT score more than um, 1,450 or three A's in A levels, GSC for medics? Okay, uh, we will have a separate webinar about this, but you can see on our website what are our minimum cutoff scores for medicine undergraduate programs. So, and the SAT is 1,410 or three A levels with A grades for medicine. Okay. Um, I'm currently studying my A-level exams along with A-level results. Can I submit my SAT score as well to make my application stronger? Yes, of course you can. Um, if you have expected A-level results, you can write those in the application along with the existing like valid SAT test score that you have, especially if it's well above the minimum required. Um, I think the next question is similar to that. Um, okay, so for GRE, do we need just quantitative part? Uh, yes, you, of course you're you know you're more than free to answer or to complete all sections of the GRE exam. Um, most professors, especially in sciences, engineering, health sciences, they will take um, you know they will basically look at the quantitative analysis section and the score that you obtain there. Uh, but you know, like if you're gonna take the test, then of course it's up to you in terms of the time you have to prepare and answer all the all the other sections. How many undergraduate scholarships are available? We will have a separate webinar about scholarships, but the answer is we don't have a fixed number. We don't have a quota of um, undergraduate scholarships. It varies every year in terms of the the number of. Um, admitted students and the quality of the students that we receive applications from. We always do our best, uh, and I know that's the case also for the deans, to award as many as possible. Uh, but again, you know, it, it varies, so we don't have a fixed number to, to give you, okay? Uh, is there a specific font type and size one should use when writing the motivation letter when applying for an undergrad? Roughly, which font size is considered too small or too big? That's a very kind of particular question. So um, I would say, uh, you know, font size 11 or 12 is fine. Something that will be easy to read on a computer screen as we are rarely now receiving kind of paper-based applications. And uh, of course, nothing like funny, you know, uh, trendy fonts try to stick to an Arial Times Roman type font, okay? And this is not the place to be creative in terms of font sizes, uh, font types. Do you accept um, EPQ, Extended Project Qualification, and as, as an A level? Um, fortunately, no, and that's due more, I think, to regulations from the Turkish Higher Education Council and what they would recognized as a valid high school completion certificate or diploma, okay? Another question, um, does the subjects taken in A-level have to be related to the program we want to study in college? That's a very good question. Actually, not related to this, but I'll answer very briefly. Um, for programs like medicine, um, well, let's say for Koch University, we should see at least one mathematics course or A level because, as I said, we have a liberal arts education approach, so we have the core program. One of the required courses of the core program for all students, if you're studying media or sociology or mathematics or industrial engineering, everyone will have to take one course related to calculus, um, maybe two in the first year, so this is why mathematics will be an A level that we would like to see in your transcript, in your uh, application. But in terms of other courses, um, not so much. For medicine, of course, if you're able to take A levels in biology, um, chemistry, that helps because that tells them that you do have a clear kind of focus towards the um, life sciences that will help you um, later on. 
but for other courses, for example, if you're interested in international relations, in sociology, media, uh, business administration, uh, that's okay. What they want to see is what kind of uh, perspectives you have gained out of taking those A-levels that would help you as a university student. Okay, so, uh, well, we still have a lot of questions here, so I'm going to just now choose those that are related to the writing of Statement of Purpose and Motivation Letters, because as I said, we will do other webinars that are more about the other elements of admission. So we, we can do another webinar related to the SAT um, scores and A-levels uh, about the recommendation letters, so that's, that's no problem for us to do more detailed events. Um, okay, so it's a good question here. In the SOP, shall we mention political problem in our country that it causes our university doesn't have well-equipped labs? So I decided to pursue our study in new country. Um, that's, okay, so here's, a, it's a tricky thing because if you say that your university didn't have a well-equipped lab, but at the same time you're saying that you have very well-developed um, skills in X or Y lab, technique or procedures or uh, then again it poses the question for the faculty member to say well if they didn't have you know uh, good equipment or they had gaps in terms of the operation of the lab because of political problems then how can they substantiate that claim that they also have good lab skills so as long as you can explain that even though you had those problems you were still able to develop your skills through X, Y, or Z activities, maybe outside of the university, then that's okay. Yeah. So, um, another question. Okay, so can high TOEFL and GRE score somewhat compensate for a relatively lower bachelor's GPA when applying for an engineering master's with thesis? Um, that's a very common question for our engineering programs, and the answer is definitely yes, because again, uh, professors know that engineering bachelors are uh, tough programs. I mean, it's not very easy to get extremely high GPAs in engineering. This is a common trend worldwide, let's say. So they will pay attention to which, I mean, which university you have graduated from, the recommendation letters, and of course, having a, a very good GRE score, it's going to kind of ease their concerns about your quantitative analysis skills. So that's why, yes, it, you know, it can compensate for that, let's say. Um, I'm just trying to check. Uh, okay, give me one second. I think the rest of the questions are related to like minimum scores and diplomas that are accepted or not. So I'm going to, I'm just gonna check the questions that we have on the chat. One second. Okay, so we have an interesting question here. I was an editor in one of the best video games websites before I started to study my undergraduate program. Shall I mention about this issue in my SOP? Yes, of course. I mean, that's quite unique, let's say, that um, before you entered university, you had a professional experience, for example, that you were responsible for processes or budgets or teams or events, like anything that can talk about um, your ability to organize your time, uh, think critically, respond to emergency situations, any, any of those things are, are important to mention. Um, there's, there's, I think, two questions whether we can have the slides after the webinar. Yes, of course. So we are um, going to put them, we're going to put the webinar recording on our website um, and they will include the, the slides, okay? Then uh, there's a question about the courses available under health sciences. If you're referring to master programs, that I would um, kindly ask you to visit our website that I have here. Let me see if I can minimize this. So if you go to international.ku.edu.tr under the graduate section, you will see um, a page which is called programs offered and you will see the Graduate School of Health Sciences. Uh, just to give you an overview, we have three master programs and three PhD programs. So they're related to medical microbiology, physiology, molecular biology, and genetics. And at the PhD level, they're related to neuroscience, reproductive uh, medicine, 
So, so they're more kind of research um, oriented, oops, sorry, research oriented master programs in health sciences. Uh, do you accept national senior certificate when applying for an undergrad? It is a school, it's a, sorry, it's a South African school leaving certificate. Um, you can apply with that, but we strongly recommend that you also submit either um, an SAT or an ACT test score to increase your admission chances. Um, besides, again, preparing a very strong motivation letter and um, you know having very good recommendation letters. You would need to check whether that specific certificate is also recognized by the by Turkey as a as a high school completion certificate. Uh, let's see. Um, there's a very common question. We take AS in my school for grade 12. Do I need A levels for the Turkish high school equivalent certificate? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, the Turkish Higher Education Council, uh, I think they, they changed the, the rule a couple of years ago. So you do need to have A levels, not AS levels to um, obtain that high school equivalent certificate. Um, Another question, will a KU campus visit be taken into account? Um, no, not really, because again, the people who are evaluating the application, they don't have any other information regarding whether you have visited us one time, 12 times or never. They're just going to evaluate you in terms of your merits. So again, they will look at their GPA, test scores, uh, motivation letter recommendation and extracurriculars. Um, of course, I guess the, the point of your question is that by visiting campus, you're showing interest in the university. That's very valid. But besides that, you can you can mention that if you want on your motivation letter that you visited the campus. And what you should explain is how visiting the campus uh, kind of motivated you to apply and specifically to, to the university. Does mentioning reading books about our course make our personal statement um, stronger. Yes, but it, it shouldn't be a very generic state of I like reading books about, um, let's say, technology. If you're going to say that, then give a bit more detail, then you can mention a specific book uh, that you read and what in the book kind of caught your attention and made you then want to do something else, whether that was to read in more detail by looking at scientific papers or attend events or meet specific people uh, that are working on that topic or that's the idea, that it's not just giving a kind of bland statement about I like reading or I like doing sports, but just tying that interest into something that has helped you develop uh, into a more well-rounded person, okay? Can we mention about art and design skills we have in the letter? Yes, of course. As I said just before, if it's an interest like reading, like sports, or that you um, like to practice or perform a specific type of art or to do or design in different formats. You can even include, um, you can mention that on the letter and also include examples as a kind of portfolio. Or if you have a website where you, or page where you feature all of your uh, work, then you can also include that on the, on the letter. Um, now there's some questions about obtaining the equivalency certificate which I will not answer right now. But again, if it, you have a combined combination of AS levels and two A levels, is it enough? Um, we're gonna go into that answer into another um, webinar, okay? Um, how can I apply for master engineering scholarship? Just very briefly, for Quach University, the process is very simple. You apply to the program. So to the masters in computer engineering, let's say, if you're admitted, your admission offer includes also your scholarship offer, which is a 100% tuition waiver, a monthly stipend, which the amount will depend on whether you're funded by the university or by a specific project from uh, a faculty member. Um, housing may be provided. Again, it depends on availability each year for master's students and uh, thesis related expenses. We also have now the opportunity to offer um, master and doctoral scholarships through the Turkish scholarship program that some of you may or may not have heard of. Um, so we will have a separate webinar uh, and we have information on our website about that as well. 
I think this is going to be the last question for today because we have already taken a lot of your time, but I, I thank you again for being here. When will graduate admissions open in spring? Please share deadlines. Yes, I know you're eager to know this. Uh, the the um, application deadlines for spring are usually published on all the graduate school websites around mid-February. Um, the deadlines, it will vary across graduate school. So uh, usually they're going to be between May and June. Some programs like law, they do have um, an MBA programs, let's say, like the, the business school programs have slightly later deadlines in July. But again, the, the best advice is to always check these specific graduate school websites because they will have uh, the deadlines there. In terms of preparation, you can think that in terms of the required documents, what takes usually the longest is to prepare for the GRE or GMAT exam and TOEFL exam. So getting out of the way early well before May or June is the, the best thing you can do so that you can have enough time to then work on your statement of purpose, request the recommendation letters from your referees and have enough time without having to, to panic. Okay, so we're going to sign off now. Thank you very much again for joining us today. Um, I know that we took a bit longer than expected and we're going to improve that for next time. If you have any questions that were not answered here or that you have in mind after today, you can email us at study at ku.edu.tr and we will be replying. We usually take 24 to 48 hours to reply. If we see that it's something very urgent, when, then of course then we try to reply immediately, but please be patient with us in that sense. So we're signing off now. Thank you very much um, and have a good evening or a good morning wherever you are. Okay, thank you.